welcome everyone uh, to the contract driven development uh, session by uh, joel and hari just a quick introduction uh, from my side so uh, hari krishnan is a founder and ceo of polarizer technologies uh, he is a polyglot full stack developer architecture consultant xp coach and the trainer and uh, joel is is an engineer by heart he is a senior consultant uh, he loves building things and apart from that when he is not uh, coding or not working he is also a great musician so without any further delay uh, over to you joel uh, let's get started thanks kartik and welcome to all of you to this talk let me uh, ask uh, my colleague hari to uh, give a quick introduction about himself first sure thanks joel uh, so i'm hari krishnan i'm a consultant and a coach i help uh, both unicorn startups and large enterprises but their transformation activities um i love contributing to the community i speak at uh, quite a few of these conferences and i volunteer also my interests include distributed systems and high performance application architecture so that's quickly about myself over to you joel thank you hari and uh, i have about um 19 years uh, odd in this industry uh, at present i am a consultant and coach uh, and uh, my focus areas tend to be agile software development software quality practices and uh, contract testing well <clears throat> let's let's jump into the session today um with a demo i'm going to show you some code uh this is uh, this is an e-commerce service uh, i i won't go to the code for this too much let's quickly take a look at its open api specification uh even if you haven't seen an api specification before uh, i'm sure you you'll all recognize an api when you see it uh this is the slash products api uh, which takes an id in the path um the id has been defined as a number as you can see here and this essentially means that this api could be slash products slash 10 slash products slash 20 so on and so forth and when you uh you know when you fire a get on this api it's going to return some product details and the product details <clears throat> the exact shape of it uh is defined in this file uh but you can see an example right there's a name type is gadget inventory right so this is how uh, the api should look let's try to run some tests on the api now um i'm going to just quickly run these tests let's give it a second start up and here we go tests are running naturally uh we are starting the spring application up here uh so that we can hit it with the tests and you have some tests that have run right uh, 12 tests as you can see from uh, this uh, name here this is a set of contract tests so let's see what this actually means <clears throat> uh the, there's a request that has gone out right i i was saying we just started the application up here so that we could hit it uh the request has gone out it's a get request to the application to slash products slash 10 and uh, the application has responded with a 200 okay and uh it has a, a payload here right and this payload is familiar i just showed this to you a few moments ago in the contract and <clears throat> as you can see it's a, a contract valid payload uh this is exactly the way the specification defines it to be and uh, this this test therefore passes just good here we have another uh, request this goes to post to slash product slash 10 uh, the payload uh, this time is uh, an actual you know product content and we get a 200 uh, and you know this is about updating product details you can see the title on the left hand side so there are 10 more essentially and these are contract tests we'll talk more about them but essentially what we are trying to say is is this api specific is this is this uh, api implemented in the correct fashion according to the specification that i showed you in the yaml file earlier um what we what what i'd like to show you next is the code for this right where is the code here that generated these 12 tests and the answer is <clears throat> this is it there's nothing more uh this code snippet is all you need and all that we are really doing here is uh defining a few details about where the service is what port is it starting up on which ip is it starting up on um and we are using this uh, very cool open source uh, tool called specmatic um and we simply extend from this class and specmatic takes it over 
and then reads the contract and generates the test for you and you have nothing to do. This is all free. Uh, essentially, Specmatic generates a test for you for free. There is no other test code aside from what you see on screen. Um, so that's contract tests. Uh, Hari will talk a lot more about this. But before I move on, I have one more thing to show you. I'll just uncomment this line and <clears throat> it says here, Specmatic generative tests. So now we take this to the next level. We simply set the flag to true, run the tests. Uh, and just from that, we have a lot more tests. And in fact, this time we're seeing failures too. In fact, if you remember, we had 12 tests passing earlier. Now we have 16 and we have 26 failing tests as well. What happened, right? What has changed? Generative, generative tests, basically what we're saying is not only are we looking at the contract now, we are, we are giving it a much more thorough test. We are generating even more tests. There are positive tests and we're even generating negative tests. So let's, let's take an example of what the negative test looks like. <clears throat> let's see, what, what, why has this test failed? It's negative, right? You see the word negative over here. Why has it failed? We're saying key zero is missing in the map, right? No such element. All right. There's an exception. Is that really the core of the problem? So let's scroll down past the exception. Let's scroll to the actual request and see what has happened. We've seen this before, right? In one of the cases earlier, post to slash product slash 10. We've seen this payload as well. We are trying to update a product, uh, details of a product. This is new. So as per the contract, the ID is supposed to be a number. The contract does not allow this to be uh, anything other than a number. It does not allow it to be null, for example. Uh, and since the contract uh, makes this explicit, Specmatic uh, just uh, knows that there's, there could be a potential problem here. And so it says, let's pass a null and see what happens. And it passes a null. The application obviously tries to read that as a zero. There is no product called, you know, with the ID zero, throws an exception there, scroll right back down, and the exception is not handled. So we throw a 500 and right there is a problem because this is a poor way to handle uh, you know, a bad request. You should be throwing a 400 series, uh, 4XX series error. In fact, in this case, ideally a 422, which is unprocessable entity in uh, HTTP. There are another 25 tests like this. <clears throat> and if you make all these tests pass, you have basically bulletproof your application. So that's uh, 26 plus 16, that's around 42 tests generated for you from the contract completely for free. No code other than what's I, what I see on the screen. We'll show you how to use Specmatic uh, you know, to do this and other kinds of things, uh, very interesting things as this uh, talk progresses. But now before we move forward, um, I think we need to take a step back um, and set context, understand what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Uh, and then we start getting deeper into how we are going to solve it. Um, and for that, I'd hand it over to you, Hari. Um, all right. So let's quickly get into the context of why this talk and what we're trying to achieve here. Before that, wasn't that a pretty awesome demo by Joel? Practically taking open API specifications and being able to generate tests for free. Uh, that's really interesting given that we had to write no code whatsoever. Why is that all important? And why is this all the more relevant? given the widespread adoption of microservices. And that's, why, that's what we're gonna take a look at now. So to set the context, let's imagine uh, that we're building a mobile application, uh, which requests product details from a service, and then the service responds with those details and the mobile app displays the same. Fairly straightforward, right? Now the application requesting the data is, is the consumer and the service responding with the data, let's call it the provider. With that terminology out of the way, Let's think about how we'd go about building this consumer, right? Let's say I am the mobile application developer and I have a dependency on the actual provider. Now, one way for me to build this application or for the mobile app is uh, to wait for the provider to become available. And only after it is available, I'll use it as a reference and build it, right? Now, this is the sequential style of development and not really productive in terms of pushing features out. So what is the typical... Uh, you know, widely accepted solution to this, I could stand up a mock server to emulate the provider so I can make independent progress on consumer application development, right? This looks good on paper. However, there's a fundamental issue here, right? The mock that I'm hand rolling in order to sort of emulate the provider need not be truly representative of the actual provider. 
now that is a big problem right how is how is that a big problem let's take a look now as a consumer application developer i may be wrongly assuming that i could send a string for an uh, for the product id while the actual service is expecting an integer and likewise the provider may be returning a name and an sku while i am wrongly assuming again that it's going to give me back the name and the price what does that lead to when i deploy the consumer application the mobile app alongside the real provider integration is going to be broken and that's bad right and what's worse such issues we know we cannot find it on our local machine because obviously like what we saw we are dependent on a hand rolled mock so we are not really getting any feedback from the real provider however this uh, same situation continues even in the continuous integration environment right because there as well we are using a hand rolled mock possibly right and for the provider it is not a very different story provider also does not have an emulation of the consumer so even the provider application engineers may be developing this application in a uh, you know an isolation right so the first instance where you realize such an issue exists this is when you deploy both these components to an environment such as integration testing and then you realize there is a compatibility issue now this is a double whammy of an issue right because not only does it compromise your integration testing environment it also blocks your path to production which means you have unhappy users now this is not a good place to be right there's more bad news so <laughs> that's the heat map at the bottom kind of represents the cost of fixing issues alongside the timeline and the later in the environment you are finding them so an issue found very much on the left in your local environment is very quick to fix right when you compare it to this compatibility issue which is being found out only in integration or worse in production that's uh, both you know it's going to cost you in terms of user experience and also it's going to cost you in terms of resolution time which is not a good idea so what would we like to do integration testing like we all know is not a panacea to any of this uh, problem statement right what we'd like to do is to be able to shift left the identification of such compatibility issues and uh, thereby try and eliminate integration testing altogether now is this even possible to find out compatibility issues without integration testing let's find out i'll hand it over to joel to show us uh, the same over to you joel all right thanks hari well um as hari said we are going to now learn how to shift left uh to make sure that we can identify these compatibility issues right on our laptops without having to get into integration testing um so stepping back um a lot of the issues that we have seen uh previously between consumer and provider um are perhaps they are caused by a communication gap there might be uh, it might be because they are documenting the apis using you know something like word or excel Uh, or even was you know perhaps word of mouth so would it not be much better much, much nicer if we could capture every detail of the api right including um, the headers in the request the types the payloads the keys the data types is the key optional is the key mandatory is it nullable is it a string so on and so forth all of that rich detail if we could capture that somehow in an open industry uh, accepted industry standard widely under, understood specification format what if we could do that the good news is these formats exist uh, and for rest the most widely used one is open api and you can put all this down in an open api specification and if the consumer and provider actually have the specification then they can get on the same page uh, and uh, about about what the form of the api will be and uh, <clears throat> that should go a long way towards improving their integration and reducing integration issues or would it because an api specification is good it's a step up but it's still a description it doesn't actually force you to do anything so it doesn't really force uh, the provider to implement the api as per the specification and it doesn't really force the consumer to have the right expectations about the shape of the api which should be as per the specification so we need something more than that we need to go beyond 
we need an executable contract. We need a contract to enforce the API specifications. Now let's talk about that first. The good news is API specifications is something that we do have. It contains all the details that need to be enforced. Everything is there. Um, what if we can turn the API specifications themselves into executable contracts? Would that not actually solve the problem? Right? Um, and that's exactly what we're going to show you. How do you turn API specifications into executable contracts, both for the provider and the consumer to ensure that the two of them continue to match the contract and how does that work? The tool that we demonstrated at the start of the talk, as I said, is an open source tool called Specmatic. Specmatic will take the open API specification and <clears throat> for the consumer, it generates a contract as stuff or what we also call smart marks. And using this, it is possible for the consumer to make sure that their expectations about the form of the API matches and is faithful to the contract. Uh, and thus the API, uh, the consumer can stay in sync with the contract. Now, having done this on the consumer side, we need something for the provider side as well. For that, Specmatic again takes the open API specification, the same open API specification and runs contract as test. With contract as test, it becomes possible for the provider to faithfully simulate the kinds of requests that uh, a consumer would send as per the contract. And then when it returns a response, as I've shown you earlier, uh, the contract test actually checks whether the response would be understood by a consumer. And so this is reciprocal. If a consumer stays in sync with the contract uh, using contract as stub, and if the provider stays in sync with the contract using contract as test, now they will integrate uh, when they get into an environment. In fact, not only that, it becomes possible for them to work independently because there is no need now for a consumer to wait for the provider to be ready uh, to start work. The consumer can just use the contract and use it, use a contract as stub and start off, right? They have something they can invoke. Uh, the provider doesn't need for the, con uh, for the consumer to be ready to be sure that they're going to integrate. They can just start off with the contract tests and know that that's going to be a faithful simulation of how actual consumers that are contract, uh, contract adhering uh, will work with the provider. <clears throat> so let me actually get now deeper into the consumer side of the story. How does the consumer emulate the provider using smart mocks? Uh, and for this piece, I am going to run a small exercise. Uh, and I think this will be helpful because it will get you actually hands on. And so you can see, you know, for yourself by actually uh, learn, learning by doing. Uh, you, you can uh, hurry. I'm, I would also like you to post uh, these details on the on the chat. Uh, you can download the open API specification sample from here. Uh, you can import this file into Postman as a collection. This is one of the nice things about having a specification format is that as it's a format, it's machine readable. Uh, and suddenly it means that your tools, other tools can understand it. Then let's download and set up Specmatic from here. Just put the two of them in the same directory. Uh, this will help you to uh, make things a little more smooth. Then you cd into the download location and run this command. Uh, this is a Java tool. So by any chance, if you don't have Java, don't worry about it. I will be doing all of this on screen. If you have Java and would like to follow along, um, you know, you can, you can follow along from here. All right. Okay. Yeah, I guess Joel, you can, uh, you can start off. So, um, before we begin the exercise, let's take a quick look at uh, the specification. Um, and now I think after seeing the demo, which I did at the beginning, this will be a little familiar. We see the same products API here. We see the get and this time the response is inline. So that means when you fire a get request against uh, slash products, what we are expecting to see uh, uh, is this response in return. And the response should contain uh, a JSON object with name and SKU, right? Both of them are strings. So the first thing that we're going to do is start this up as a stub. For that, we're going to say uh, Java minus jar, specmatic dot jar, stub, products API dot yaml. Let's run this and see what we see. 
Now, my output might look a little different from yours, but the most important thing is that you get this line at the end. Stub server is running on HTTP colon slash slash uh, NEIP colon 9000, control C to stop, right? And uh, once you have that, uh, and, and this command uh, is, is posted as well in the chat, so I think you should be able to run it from there. Once you have this, the next thing you can do is step into Postman. And uh, I'm sh you can you can do the same thing with curl, but I'm going to do the demo using Postman because I think most people should have it. We're going to import this contract, right? Let's start off with that. Let's import the contract. Boom! Postman understands it, which is awesome. Import. Okay, now we have a sample products API. We have get products, and Postman is set up. So essentially, <clears throat> we are. Uh, have a let's change this base URL. I'm going to change it to keep things simple. Local post 9000 to slash products colon ID. Colon ID here is Postman uh, syntax for a variable. The variable is declared below path as pa under path of variables. And Postman is generated something random. Let's put in you know a value of our own and let's hit send. See what that gives us. We get a response with some random values. What's happening here? So basically. Uh, Specmatic has understood slash products slash one. It knows what that means because this is in the specification. But um, it, we have not yet told it what to do with slash products slash one. Uh, and so it helpfully goes back to the specification, uh, looks at the format of the response, generates a response and returns it. And this is basically a randomly generated response with the right keys. Um, just to prove that it's possible I'll to tell Specmatic what to do, send five and uh, it returns batteries with, you know, this is a preset value. I told Specmatic how to respond to five. That's something that we will see later, a little bit later. Has everyone followed with me so far? Has everyone got to this point? After this, I'm going to take it on to uh, something a little uh, uh, a little further basically so I'm not going to ask everyone to follow along but I just like to see that you've you've reached this point and you know how to set up uh, Specmatic and invoke it and pass it a contract okay okay I guess it's all great okay nice thanks for the feedback yeah Go ahead. Cool. thanks so I'm going to take it further now now I'm going to do a lot more demos and in the interests of time, I'm just going to show you how this works. But I think uh, what you can always do is get your hands on an open API specification. And these things are all very easy to try out. Uh, we will share with you the documentation for doing this later. But for now, I'm going to kill this. And I'm going to switch to another window with a slightly more involved contract. Where we are going to try out a few more things. So you can see the this is a very similar contract. In fact, this piece is exactly the same. And I've added on um, a small API here. Here in the second API is for adding a product. So slash products, you post an object to it and you add a product. So let's see what uh, what we can do, right? Uh, we're gonna say specmatic stub products API, right? You've seen this command before. This time I'm not saying Java minus Java because I am setting. I have set up Specmatic as an alias, uh, so the command just works, <clears throat> and we start the stub off. And uh, now we try five, and you see the randomized response because this time uh, I've started up a new instance of Specmatic, and I haven't told Specmatic what to do with uh, the value five. Well, let's do that. Now we'll see how we do this. So first, I created a directory. All right, inside the directory, I'll create a file. Let's call it stop.json. Inside this file, so Specmatic is reacting and uh, it knows that there's something wrong with the file, so it hasn't loaded it. Inside the file, I will put this content. Which I've just kept in a snippet there. And uh, I will just change this to, right? as well as ABC123, save it, right? 
Um, I'll just uh, give this a quick restart. There you go. Specmatic has read and accepted this uh, file. Let's fire a request here. Specmatic now returns batteries ABC123. All right. So first question is, what if I want to stub out multiple things? How do I do that? Let's say that it's not only batteries, but also torches. Right? So we'll call this torches. We'll rename this to batteries. In torches, I guess we should have a different product ID. Make that 10. Torches. Save it. <clears throat> 5 reacts with batteries. 10 reacts with torches. Right. Of course, we forgot to change the SKU. Right. It's ABC123. And if I send it with 5, it still says ABC123. And uh, I think for the purpose of you know this test this situation, we really don't care what the value is. So I'm, I don't want to have to think about it. I just say string. Here I'm just telling Specmatic, you return some random you know value. Leave, leave me out of it. You figure it out. I don't care what you return. Just get me a string back. Right. And uh, let's see now what happens when I make a request to five. Specmatic returned a random value. And if I do 10, Specmatic returns another random value. Right? And uh, this way I can get a load of my head. Let Specmatic do the work that I don't want to do. Um, and this makes things a little easier. Maybe instead of torches this time, we'll call it notebooks. And uh, this would be 15. And this would be notebooks. And voila. Let's give that a right. Let's see what happens when you do 15. 15 should just work. There you go. Notebooks returned as well. Of course, now comes the next interesting point. What if we tell Specmatic to stub out? The whole point of doing this was we should not be able to stub out something incorrect. So let's try to do that and see what happens. We know SKU is supposed to be a string, not a number. So let's try to stub out a number. Give spec yeah there you go specmatic immediately tells you response.body.sku so these are the breadcrumbs the breadcrumbs basically give you pinpointed feedback about where the problem is and this is exactly what the problem is contract expected string but stub contained 10 which is a number um which is fair uh interestingly you know we had set this before we made this change now specmatic no more recognizes 15 uh, because it's rejected it Right. Specmatic will not accept a stub that does not match the contract. So enough of the response. Let's take this to the request. Let's say we want to, we had, a, we had an API to create something, right? So let's see how that would work. We say create towel, right? Uh, the create API was a post, as I recall. So there was a post. Um, to slash products, the body basically goes in the request this time. This time we are saying uh, towel, we are saying PQR XYZ, and what should the body be here? Uh, we'll have uh, returns with a 10 or something. Let's save it, let's see what Specmatic thinks. Um, we need to give that a restart. Oh, this is interesting. It looks like we got the body wrong. So we are saying response.body.sku contract expected string but stub contained 10. So essentially, I stubbed this out incorrectly. Let, uh, let me just quickly check uh, the contract. The contract basically says we return an ID, right? So obviously that was wrong. I'm going to return an ID. And let's make that 10. Let's hope that we got it right this time. Um, Specmatic will take a second, It'll restart. Oh, uh, sorry, this was supposed to be a string. Oops. Oh, the problem is somewhere else. 
the problem is somewhere else my bad uh, I, I think this is one of the other expectations which we had uh, which we had set up incorrectly yeah we didn't revert that <laughs> Uh, and, and so now, now we have this problem here, right? I think I think we should be all good now. But but this is interesting. Uh, you, this is exactly this is exactly the kind of problem that Specmatic is designed to solve, right? Everything is loaded now successfully. Uh, I was not allowed to. Nothing was allowed to fall. Nothing was allowed to fall through the cracks. I, I missed one thing here. I got it there. Specmatic caught this one. I fixed that. I missed this. Specmatic caught that. Like nothing is allowed to fall through the cracks. So now we post. Products, towel, PQR, etc. Let's just take this body and post it, right? Um, I'm going to create a new request here. Let's post it to HTTP localhost 9000 products. We post the body. Uh, we say raw. We say JSON. We post this, right? And we send it. Specmatic accepts it. Of course, down to the same question, we might not really care about string. We send that. That is accepted as well. Um, and once again, let's try to answer the obvious. What happens if we stub something out here? Uh, we know what we know what error we get, right? What happens if we try to do that here as well? Specmatic doesn't accept it, right? Specmatic won't even accept the request. Now, now this time, this time the error is not coming from the stub. This time the error is coming from the request. The SKU was incorrect. The SKU was the wrong type. Uh, this is this doesn't even reach the stub. Specmatic just tells us that the request was wrong. Okay. Um, now we've spent a good amount of time looking at Specmatic and even seeing literally on the fly how my mistakes during the demo were caught by Specmatic, uh, right? Which is, I think, uh, pretty cool. But <clears throat> we should now talk about workflow tests uh, in a sort of, in a real, um, more of a real scenario. What if we were to post to one API some data, get back some ID, and then we have to pass that to the stub, right? The the thing is, there there might be you might you might have multiple applications. Uh, you might you might have an application which you're testing, whose uh, ID you get back, and you need to pass that to another ID to another API which you need to stub out. Um, and that basically means you're getting the ID from some application on the flight during the test. Uh, and if you're doing that. What, what are you going to put in the file, right? We've seen that everything that goes into a stub file has to be known ahead of time. But if I'm going to get an app, an ID in the test from some application and the ID is coming live, I can't predict what that ID is going to be, but maybe I want to validate that ID. Maybe I want to validate that the request that goes out to the stub has the right ID which just got generated. What do I put in my file? I, I can't, obviously the answer is I can't put anything in the file because I can't predict it ahead of time, right? This, is, this much is obvious. Um, and uh, obviously, I've shown you the Specmatic restarts, but a restart is not a valid way of you know running a test. It's very unpredictable. What we really need to do is we need to be able to tell Specmatic after it has loaded. Here we've seen how to tell Specmatic before it loads, right? And when we make the change to the file, it reloads everything. But now we need to tell a running instance of Specmatic um, what to expect and how to respond. Um, so let's see how we do that. I've shown you, you know, uh, sorry, let's come back to this window. I've shown you how to stub this out, right? We know how this looks in a file. Well, it's pretty simple. Specmatic has an API called set expectations. Expectations is basically what you tell Specmatic to expect. And when it gets that request, what does it respond with? So we are setting expectations with Specmatic. We are saying when you receive slash post slash products, this time to something different. You know, let's let's call this a sponge for whatever reason, and we say uh, PQR one two three return a response twenty. Right? We send this out to Specmatic, and Specmatic returns a two hundred. This is important 
because right here when specmatic responds you know whether your expectations are correct or not so to start with let's actually see how well this worked uh, right we say sponge and we say pqr123 and we get a response back oh sorry i had a typo there we get a response back which is id20 which is great um we take this take the next step here how exactly would specmatic uh, react if we try to set something incorrect so we set an sku id which is a number you've seen this before you know what to expect but let's go the whole way here you go request.body.sku so basically specmatic never lets it go at every stage be it an expectation be it a request be it a response in the expectation specmatic will flag it and it will not miss it and that means you get the early feedback right on your laptop you don't need to wait uh, to write a line of code before this happens um so this is this is how you get early feedback this is how you can stub something out dynamically and now we need to actually fit this into a test right let's let's try to take all of this and put it together and see how does this actually work with a test uh before we go there and I show you how that works let's quickly review the anatomy of a component test you typically have a test uh, you will have of course a system under test and then since since we have since we are stubbing out the api uh before you know before integration we have specmatic we have a specmatic stub which has been given a contract now every test has typically three phases arrange act and assert right in the arrange phase in this case uh the test will tell specmatic what to you know expect and what to return uh dynamically in many cases right specmatic will validate this with the contract and will return the necessary feedback we'll see how this works later once this is done the test will now act the act section is where the test invokes the consumer this could be a mobile client in this diagram it could be another microservice anything that consumes another api as a consumer right uh the my, the consumer will now hit the uh, api which in this case is specmatic specmatic will respond uh the consumer responds to the test the test now runs a set of assertions on the response to check whether everything passed or not okay and with that as background let's just quickly take a look at how the actual test looks um this is how it is right this is the arrange section i just described this is the url you have seen before this is the request format you have seen before right again we are stubbing out uh something like slash products gadget etc <clears throat> this is the response this is a, a framework called karate uh, okay the test is written in karate and the key thing is this line on line 36 which i have highlighted is an assertion we are asserting that specmatic returns 200 if specmatic has to reject the api it will return a 400 and this assertion will break the test right here you are not even going to waste the time to run the rest of it because you know right here that what the test expects of the a uh, downstream api is incorrect um but assuming that specmatic does accept uh, this expectation uh, and then moves ahead the test then makes the request to the system under test this uh, api is the system being tested and this is a test that is testing a microservice so this microservice uh, basically receives a call it calls specmatic downstream specmatic responds microservice responds here and now the test asserts uh on the response to the microservice right and uh, this is a real world this is how it would work in the real world on an actual test framework doesn't matter specmatic is framework and language agnostic this is karate you could do this with you know anything else selenium or whatever other framework you need right all right um this has been a deep dive into how it is possible for the consumer to stay in sync with the contract by validating their expectations about how the api is going to look this is good so far now we need to take a, a turn to the other side and see how it works for the provider uh, and for that i'll turn it over to hari all your say thanks joel that's pretty awesome for the deep dive into the consumer side so now let's look at the provider side of the story right so if you recollect the image earlier that uh, joel was uh, sharing of uh, specmatic uh, 
trying to keep the equation balanced on both sides. So for the consumer, you do all the stubbing and the mocking. For the provider, we need to do something called contract test test, right? And this is the initial teaser that we did with the free test we were generating. But now I'd like to do something a little bit more interesting. And I'd like to give it a spin in terms of trying to understand what we're trying to do here. Right? So given you have a specification and you have a system under test, we could generate tests and that much you have already seen, right? We could use Specmatic to uh, leverage the specification as tests and verify that the system is indeed adhering to the specification or not. Now, if this is the case, there is a hypothetical scenario we can think about. What if the provider code does not exist at all and all you have is the specification, right? Then there is something more interesting I can do, which is I have tests, I have no code, which means I could do test first development, right? Which is something on the lines of test driven development. So let's actually try that out. Would it, would it not be a fun activity to check? So I have a blank application here, which is more like a, you know, a Spring Boot uh, Kotlin based application, which I just directly created by uh, going to start.spring.io and it's an empty shell, right? And this is a command, which is essentially going to run the test uh, based on the products API YAML file, which is the specification for this particular app. It's got one path here for products and uh, it is a fairly straightforward uh, specification. It has only one operation. Um, it does the get and then for the response, you will get back the product details with the name and the SKU. That's pretty much all we are trying to achieve. So what I'm going to do is start off by uh, directly running the Specmatic test command and I'm going to say the app is uh, located at this location, which is localhost port 8080. Let's see what happens. Okay, obviously it's going to fail because we, we did expect that, right? There is no application to actually respond. So you got a connection refused. So what I'm going to do now is very quickly um, uh, just start off this app here and uh, let's run it. And as soon as the app gets going, I'm going to kick, kick off that command again. So the app is running on port 8080. So now I go back to my turn, terminal and I run the same command again. Now this time around you have a failure, but it's not like connection refused. You got a 404. And that's again, fairly obvious because the application is running on port 80, but then you don't have an endpoint uh, to actually support that slash product slash product ID, right? So why don't we go ahead and flesh out that piece of the code? So what I'm going to do is quickly paste in some snippet of code here, which I have and say, um, for this path, product slash product ID, I'm going to like any good developer would do. I'm going to return hello world to start off with. Why not? This is a perfectly valid, uh, endpoint that I'm adding to my code. And this time around, I don't want to keep going back to restarting the app. And then, you know, going to the command line and then running it, it's getting a little repetitive, right? What you could also do with Specmatic is essentially uh, have, uh, you know, the contract tests here, right? Essentially. Uh, so what I'm uh, going to do here is I have this contract test, which uh, extends from Specmatic JUnit support. And for this capability to be available, I have uh, included uh, Specmatic JUnit support into my uh, Gradle build file. So I'm going to show you that. I, why I wanted to show you this specifically is I want to highlight that the JUnit support, the Specmatic support is being added as a test implementation capability only. So which means Specmatic out and out is not going to be part of your production uh, deliverable at all. It's only during your test infrastructure. Right. So I've added this support and on the contract test side, the only pieces of information I have to do is extend this. And then what I was earlier doing on the command line here is to provide the coordinates of the application, which is localhost in port 8080. This very same things I'm going to do here with, uh, you know, the uh, system properties during the setup stage. And I'm also starting off the spring app. And then in the teardown, I close the spring app. That's pretty much all. It's very basic plumbing, no other code, right? Now, instead of writing, you know, executing this command line command, I'm going to instead execute the contract test. Let's see what happens. So 
So last time we saw the 404 because the URL itself was not supported by the application. Now this time around, let's see what is the failure. So you got a test failure now, and this time it's not a 404, it's still a 200. So what? why did the test fail? Again, fairly obvious because I returned a hello world, but the specification file says that we are expecting a object with name and SKU, right? So obviously I didn't do a good job. I need to go back and next do the next incremental step, which is I'm going to add in the uh, data object here, which is the product itself. Very quickly, let me paste that snippet in. And I'm also going to return the actual product itself, which the test is expecting based off of the API specification. Okay. And I quickly kick it off again. Will it pass now? Yes, no, maybe. Could pull it on the, in the chat. Hooray, we got the green. It's always a joy, right? When you go from red to green, when you're doing test driven development sort of uh, approach. Yeah, so this is fun. Uh, we've gotten to this point, but then this is not really how the real applications would look like, right? Uh, because you have to think about test data management now. So let's take a look at that. Now, if you look at the log here for this request, Specmatic randomly generated some ID, 887, and sent it. And because we're always hard coding and responding with product details, the test is always going to pass. So that's not a real, uh, you know, very watertight test. In uh, What is realistic is your database might have only one product or test data. You have like two, three rows. And anything else which comes in, it's not going to be able to fetch. So I'm going to simulate that situation by saying, if the product ID is uh, not equal to two, so let's say that's the only ID that I have in my test data, right? I'm going to throw a runtime exception. So I'm not entirely fleshing out all the repository layer and the service layer and all the DDD layers here. But just for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm quickly trying to say that this line here, line number 14, is sort of representing your repository, which says, I don't have any other test data. Now let's kick off this test again and see what happens. Will it pass? Will it fail? And if it fails, what will it fail for? That's the big question. OK, there is a null, which is interesting. Let's scroll down to see what happened. Oh, oh, OK, oh my, this is a 500 internal server error. And that's not good news, right? Like ideally we have to handle it, but then first order of business is go from a failing test to a passing test, and then we'll get back to this 500 problem. So what is the issue here? Specmatic is repeatedly sending some random IDs. Last time it sent some other number, this time it is sending 650. But in my test data, I only have ID two. So how do I tell Specmatic that um, you need to send two and just ran some random number? So what I am going to do is leverage examples inside of um, open api specification so i'm going to say uh, value 2 for this particular parameter called id and also on the response side i'm going to say that the name and the sku are these two values i'll save that in and then i'm going to kick off the test that's the only change i've done here now will it pass I'm going to keep asking you this question. So it's going to be interesting if you can post in the chat, what are you guessing? So we could almost try pairing on this problem, right? Okay. So this time it passed. Again, it's a good feeling. We went from red to green to red to green. So we have a good rhythm going here in terms of the TDD. Uh, so why did this work? That's the big question. If you look at what I did, I gave a very specific name to this example on the request side called 200 underscore OK. And I use the same name down here in the response for the response schema also. Now, this is not a capability that's coming out of OpenAPI. OpenAPI has request and then multiple responses, right? I could define 200, 400, 404, 422, so on. But the issue is uh, the which request will generate which sort of a response code is not necessarily possible to define within plain OpenAPI. So what we've done with Specmatic is use this naming convention based uh, mechanism to stitch together examples 
to say, hey, this kind of request produces this kind of a response, right? And that's how Specmatic is able to send it to and glean that, yeah, I got back a book and this is KU, so it makes sense. And that's how this test passed, okay? Now let's get back to the original issue, right? Which is, it was throwing a 500 and which is not the right thing to do, which means now I need to define how the application should behave in case of a uh, 404, if the uh, ID is not found. So I'm gonna quickly paste one more example in, which makes sense, right? And I'm gonna give it a meaningful name such as 404 not found. And by now you also know the drill because I need to say, I need to have a 404 response here, right? I'm gonna paste that in also. So right after here, I'm gonna paste in the uh, error schema itself. So I'm gonna say for the error, I need the timestamp, the status and the path where it happened. So I put in all those good stuff and uh, make sure this is going to work. So, and obviously I cannot stop here. I need also need to give the example for this situation. So I'm gonna put that in right here. I'm gonna say this time around, I name it according to the same name in the request. But I'm not really defining what I what the timestamp should be, what the status should be, because these values will keep changing, right? I cannot hard code it into the example. So which is why I'm doing the same thing which Joel did earlier, right? Which is Specmatic is able to uh, figure out uh, if it is just a string or it can pattern match a data type or it can like you know match a very specific value. So I'm gonna say I don't really care as long as these four uh, attributes are there in the response. Now with that, I've modified the specification. So let me run the test again and see what happens. Now notice how my behavior itself has changed, right? Like practically this time, uh, I'm not changing the code. I'm changing the specification first. So I'm almost becoming a spec first developer, right? Like or a test first developer in this case. So in this scenario, what happened? We had one test pass and one test fail. And which was the test that failed? Obviously the one with the 404, right? It sent a zero. It was expecting a 404, but then it got a 500. Now we need to fix that problem. Now this is easy. Uh, in uh, Spring Boot, that's not a very difficult problem. I just need to define uh, an error for 404. I'm gonna do that right here, right? I'm gonna define this, import it. Why is that a problem? I guess that's a string. Still no problem. Hmm, okay. Should be that. Yeah, there. This can be a little bit of a problem here. And then once we're done that, instead of throwing a runtime exception, this time around, I'll throw a very specific exception that I'm doing. This is just Spring Boot way of doing it, but then if you are using any other stack, you could do whatever makes sense there. Now with that, I'm gonna run the app again. I mean, I'm gonna run the test again and will it pass now? And this is a lot of fun, right? Because you're not really trying to, you know, just randomly just sit and write code and figure out whether this is work or going to work or not. Now I'm practically writing just enough code to fit the bill for the specification. And every time I make a change, I do make the change in the specification first, which means I'm thinking about the API design first. Look how it forced me, right? Because I did not have a 404 in the first place, right? Now, because I did something in the app and I realized oh, I did not have, uh, I had not designed the, the error code. So I came, up, uh, came over here, I designed my error schema. Then I added a 404 response and then built the app. So it's a nice little feedback loop for me 
to make sure that I'm pretty much in line with the specification and also building to the specification. And nowhere have I gone off the actual track that I need to be on. And just to call out, I have used Spring Boot for this uh, demonstration, but then again, Specmatic is both language and platform agnostic. It's just an executable, like I showed you earlier. I can run it from command line as well, but just for the purpose of convenience, and since I have it, I'm using the JUnit support for contract testing. Now that is, this is what we called a tracer bullet approach, wherein we use the initial specification more like an acceptance criteria and use that to flesh out the initial pieces of the uh, code itself, right? And then from there on, of course, you will need uh, to further flesh out this application by uh, putting in your API tests and then actually driving the logic forward and the further layers. But this locks in your API signature and that's the real important part that you need to take away from this exercise. So with that, I will get back to the deck. And uh, uh, one last bit, which I want to leave you with on the tracer bullet approach is uh, think about API specifications as your done criteria, right? One of the done criteria for your API itself. Now, if you have that, then this sort of an approach to use it as a test for building out your application is not just about testing your application, it's actually designing your APIs better. So that's the important piece. So contract testing can often, often get taken uh, for a testing approach, but if you think about it, it's largely about API design. Just like TDD itself is not about testing and it's more about design. Okay, so with that, I will hand it over to Joel to talk about this very, very interesting topic called contract versus contract testing. Over to you, Joel. So let's quickly um, review what we've seen so far before moving ahead. We have seen how consumers can stay in sync with the specification by uh, using contract as stub to validate their expectations of how the provider API is going to work. We have seen how uh, the provider API can stay in sync with the same specification um, by using contract tests so that they know exactly how consumers would send requests and they can make sure that their responses will be uh, easy to consume for the consumers. And so as long as both are doing their due diligence, uh, we know that they will integrate and that they can also both start development independently, securing the knowledge that uh, they are staying in sync with the contract and thereby with each other. So this is all, this is good so far. I think we made a lot of progress uh, and seen a lot of things since the start of this talk. Uh, the story isn't over yet um, because we haven't yet seen what happens when we change the contract, right? Is it possible that there could be some compatibility problem introduced when someone changes a contract? Um, and uh, to understand that, let's briefly take a step back and understand what we mean by backward compatibility. Um, essentially, what let's take the example of uh, some provider API. Let, let's say you make a change to the provider, right? This is now an updated provider. You made some changes and you deploy it into some environment. The consumers have not been changed yet. Now the consumer makes some request to the provider, which is now updated. And all of a sudden, the response from the provider is no longer understood by the consumer. What does this mean? It means the provider is no more compatible with the consumer. And we would also say the provider is backward incompatible. Uh, why backward? Because the provider has changed and moved ahead, the consumer has not. Right. Um, so this is overall what we mean by backward compatibility. You could say the provider is now backward incompatible or you could say the change to the provider is a backward incompatible change. Um, and now let's bring this into the world of contracts. right? Pop quiz, what if we make changes to the contract in the request? Let's say you add a mandatory required field. Is this considered backward compatible? In the world of contracts, what that means is, what we're really asking is, if I make a change to the contract and a provider implements this change, will the new provider still be compatible with existing consumers that have not changed? Right, And if that is not going to be the case, then we consider the changes to the contract to be backward incompatible changes. So to repeat my question, 
in the request, if we add a mandatory or required field, is this a backward compatible change? I'm going to open my chat window and I'd like you to post, um, you know, your responses. You can just say yes or no. I'll just give it about, you know, 10, 15 seconds. You can just post your thoughts there. Right? Backward compatible. I'll ask uh, others, I'll give it a little longer in case anyone else wishes to post as well. Santosh says yes. How do the others feel? I'll leave you to monitor the chat, Hari, and let me know when to go ahead. Sure, Joel. We have one or two responses now, just waiting for the rest. Just take a guess. It's <laughs> There's nothing. Uh, this is a very uh, straightforward uh, quiz. We don't have any, uh, you know, curveballs here. The curveballs are yet to come. So, yes, no, maybe. Okay. Santosh Kumar says yes. Prashant says no. So we have a fair mix, Joel. Fine. I'll tell you address the audience on why this is or this no, this is not compatible. Okay. So I think now the time has come to ask for Specmatic's opinion as well. Um, let me just quickly adjust this so that I can see over the Zoom bar. Uh, so let's make this change here. I have the current contract as it stands today. And I am going to make the change in another file. So let's, let's take this as an example. You've seen this API before. I think you're all familiar with it. We have two files. One is with the current contract, which remains unchanged so that we can compare it. Uh, and then there's another file with the new contract where we're going to make the change. Currently, the two are identical. You have the slash products API. You've seen this before. We're using this to create a product. We are passing a JSON object to it, name and SKU. At this stage, SKU is not mandatory. The question was, what if we add a mandatory field? We'll add a mandatory field. See what happens. <clears throat> uh, we are now going to say specmatic compare. We'll say products API current compare it with products API new and see what the result is. The answer seems to be that this is not a backward compatible change. Why is that? Let's reason this out for a second. What has happened here? New contract expects key named SKU in the request, but it is missing from the old contract. This means that if a provider had implemented this contract, a compliant provider would now expect SKU to definitely be there because it's mandatory. But if you put this in an environment with existing consumers where SKU was not mandatory, then an unchanged consumer may not send SKU. And if it does not send SKU, this would not show up in the request. And this might turn into some exception when the provider looks for it. Maybe in Java, that might become a null reference exception. In JavaScript, that might become undefined. There are various ways people, you know, languages represent a key that does not exist. This key would not exist and would break the provider. And hence, this is considered a backward incompatible change. What I'd like to point out before moving ahead is that because I ran this command on my laptop locally, I did not even have to implement a single line of provider code or a single line of consumer code. I didn't have to get any errors, be it contract test errors, be it, uh, you know, integrated uh, system errors. There were no errors at all. I got this just by making a change to the contract and comparing the old with the new, and I got it within seconds. No other code written. So <clears throat> let's take another example. In the request, if I change an optional nullable to optional non-nullable, this, what do you think? This is actually also a relatively easy one. What do you think? I'll ask uh, Hari to uh, monitor the comments and let me know. Sure. I pasted the same question in the chat so you can stare at it for a little longer. And because there are two aspects to it, optional, nullable, optional, non-nullable. So there's a truth table now you have to think through.
just take a wild guess it's okay i think sometimes it's also a good idea to just trust your intuition on all of these things no okay we have no it's backward incompatible okay joel i guess you can go ahead and you know break the Not. mystery so let us try this out we will revert this back so that it's the same as before now we remove nullable right we are going from now sku is optional we are going from optional nullable to optional compulsory let's compare the two for those who thought it was backward incompatible that is correct the wheels turn a little bit longer for this one though because of the fact that there are multiple uh, factors to consider and i could see that it took a little longer for the first response to come in um and the reason here is that there was a string uh, in the new contract it was nullable in the old contract and that means that a new provider um which implements this changes only expecting a string whereas old consumers may be sending null as well uh and that could break a provider because they are going to expect a string and get a null uh right here again there was no need to write code um and you got this feedback without writing any code in the consumer or provider you got it for free let's take a third example what if i change the schema component that is referenced you know somewhere in the request and response so maybe it's two or three levels deep maybe it is there in multiple parts of the hierarchy maybe it is there in multiple files maybe there are remote references right and uh i want to show you an example of that before we move ahead what do i mean by this right something like this you have a contract here that has uh, several different apis i'll just uh, show you what it looks like there's cart inventory product storage storage etc this is an e-commerce contract it's a little more involved a little more real world there are a lot a lot of different uh, apis in here and all of these are different right let's say that the change we want to implement is a compliance request let's say that state is no longer nullable now we take nullable off what is the effect Uh, what is the effect of this change to the address field if i look at the address field it is in various areas basically inside the component section but that it is not to be found uh, directly in the in the requests or responses and so we are going to have to go one by one and figure out where it is and the first one might be inventory response is this a problem is it even here is it even here at all warehouse info okay warehouse info contains it you know now you think through this uh and so on right i'm going to have to think this through for request and response across multiple different apis maybe i have thought it through for response but somewhere if i scroll down squirrelled away devilishly is something in the request now i have this one request to think about as well but it's somewhere deep i might have missed it complex contracts are like that real world contracts are like that it's very easy to miss stuff what's the guarantee that you're going to get it right and uh this contract if once you start implementation it's too late we want to actually get this feedback even before a single line of developer code is written right application code is written before a developer actually picks this contract up to implement and a check like this is basically so easy and cheap to run and gives you the feedback right here even before you start development why would you not do it right it's super easy super cheap in fact you can even integrate this with your ci builds and make sure that uh backward incompatible contracts you know never even make it out the door in case you miss it on your on your own laptop it hits ci uh how does how that works i think hari might uh, you know we'll probably talk a little bit about later um but this is a very powerful tool that makes sure that even the contract so now we have safeguarded the consumer we have safeguarded the provider and this way we safeguard the contract as well a little bit about how we do that contract versus contract right what what did we say hari made a reference to this at the start um this is a patent pending uh, technique that uh, that i'm talking about with specmatic uses it turns out that if you start up version 2 of the contract as a stub 
which represents the new provider and you start up version 1 of the contract and run it as tests which represent old consumers. If version 1's contract tests pass, it means that the contract changes in version 2 are backward compatible because all the requests from generated by version 1 contract were understood by version 2 stub and all the responses that came back from version 2 stub were understood by version 1's contract. This is a very naive uh, explanation. We've done a lot more work under the hood to make this uh, bulletproofed and fast. Um, but uh, this runs within seconds as you've seen uh, for all contracts. Now with that, having covered backward compatibility, I'll hand it over to Hari to talk about the next topic. All right, so uh, quickly going into my slides. So we've seen three major concepts, right? Which is contract as test, contract as stub, and contract versus contract testing. And there's an overarching theme that you would have noticed. It's a completely no code approach so far, especially the backward compatibility, just to highlight what Joel was saying, which is all you had to do to experiment with an API change is practically just uh, go about uh, making changes to the specification and then experiment away. And you pretty much get a feedback on to uh, whether this is going to be a compatible change or not, right? That's the overall theme which we have been keeping in mind while we built Specmatic out as a tool. Now, with that, I would like to call your attention to this topic called central contract repo. And why is this so important? Um, and this big question about are we on the same page? And what is the topic on which we need to be on the same page? And why do we need tra to treat contracts as code? So, okay, let's take a look at uh, the situation. Now, despite all the hard work we've done so far, it's very much likely that let's say I'm the provider application developer. I made a change to the provider code and then I forget updating the contract or I miss, I update the contract. I do all the due diligence there, but then I forget to send the contract over to someone over an email or upload it to the documentation website or something like that, right? And on the consumer side, I may not be on the most current version of the open API specification. I could have potentially not have downloaded it or maybe I just missed the email from the provider application team. Now that means both this consumer and provider application teams may be working off of a, uh, you know, multiple versions of the same specification in their own sources of truth, which means you're back to square one. We have broken integration. Now <laughs> that's not a pretty picture. What we need is a single source of truth when it comes to the open API specification, because that's when you can really leverage the power of having a common agreement or a contract, right? That's when we started thinking about where, which is the right place to keep these contracts. And where else would you keep it? It is code, right? Contracts are code, like open API specification is a YAML file. So why would you keep it anywhere else? We, the ideal place for it to be is a repository, a version control system. In our case, we use Git. We call it the central contract repo. Now, if your specification needs to get uh, to the central contract repo, it needs to path, pass a path of rigor, right? So that could be done through pull request or merge request process. The initial step could be a linter, wherein you just verify that the specification is in line with your organization's uh, you know, style guide for how you are supposed to build your API specifications and whatnot. There are tons of tools out there. The ones which we are using right now is something called Stoplight Spectral. It's a pretty cool tool. And once you're done with the basic linting, then comes the important piece, which is the backward compatibility testing, uh, which Joel just demonstrated. Uh, that is really powerful because that's going to let you figure out if the changes that you're making is a compatible or backward breaking change or not. And only then you can move on to the next step, which could be a manual review if at all necessary. And then you can merge the change into the Git repository itself. Now you may ask a question. What if the second stage of this pull request process uh, comes out as, you know, like it's not backward compatible? What do we do then? Then it means it's a signal for a version bump, right? So, what we are following as a versioning strategy for our contracts is a semantic versioning. But then again, it's not the only way of doing it. What, why we find it useful is because it makes sense in the context of what we are operating. So, if it is a major uh, version upgrade, because 
the it's a backward incompatible change, right? In that case, we might go from 1.0.0 to 2.0.0. And if it's a backward compatible change, but there's still a behavior change, right? In that case, we might just go from 1.1, 1.0 to 1.1, which is just a minor version upgrade. Patch version is reserved for only a structural change. So for example, if I'm extracting a mixin schema from the central open API and pulling it out for reuse purposes, only the structure is changing and the behavior is remaining absolutely the same. In that case, we might just have a notional patch upgrade. So this is the strategy we've been following. Now, once that is done, uh, and you have the central contract repo with all the contracts living there, the next immediate question is how do I pull it down to the local environment? How does the consumer application engineer pull it down to his or her laptop? And likewise for the provider. Now that's where this file called specmatic.json comes in. And that's a config file that you would have seen earlier that I was using and Joel was also using for the teaser. And that's the one which is going to let Specmatic know where to pull the contracts from and what to do with it. And by which I mean, I'd like to quickly showcase what this JSON file looks like. So this is the Specmatic.json uh, config file. It has at the top, the coordinates to your repository itself where your specifications reside. Ideally should be only one, right? And then you have two sections. You have test and you have stub. Now a contract like you've already seen can be leveraged both as a test or as a stub. And it depends on which context you're operating in. If you're operating in the context of a consumer, the contract may be leveraged as a stub. And likewise, on the in the context of a provider, the same contract may be leveraged as a, uh, a test. So let's actually take an example of this. So this is a central contract repo that we are maintaining on uh, as an example. And if you notice here, we have um, like just a few contracts sitting here and the naming convention for the folder structure is more like a typical package naming convention that you would follow in Java or C sharp or any other programming language, because it just makes sense, right? To organize your contracts in the same uh, hierarchy as you would any other code because contract is code. Now, once it is in here, uh, let's say I have this UI application, which is the consumer, uh, which needs to pull these contracts and need to emulate the provider. So in this case, I reference the contract sitting there under the stub category. Notice how this API order v1.yaml is used as a stub here. Now this is the consumer application, right? Now for the provider, this is the provider for the same consumer that you saw earlier. Here, I won't be using it as a stub because I need to emulate the consumer, right? So in this case, the same YAML file is being referenced under the test category of the Specmatic JSON. And that's how you are able to pull it. Since it is Git and since Specmatic has been configured with Git, it is always able to pull the latest version, be it your local laptop or be it a CI environment or any other environment it's running on. There is no question of the contract not being up to date. So that's the important piece. Now with that out of the way, let's actually piece all of these things together, right? Contract as test, contract as stub, a contract versus contract, and then you have central contract repository. Now with these four items, how does it all fit into your CI pipeline itself? How do you embrace CDD in the CI? Now you know that the central contract repo has the open API files and Specmatic can pull from there and it can make it available as contract as stub for server for your local environment of the consumer and also contract as test for the local environment of the provider. This part we've seen. Let's actually take a look at how this pans out for the CI environment for the consumer. In the CI, after the, you have run the unit test for the consumer, when you're component testing, you don't have to look for another tool for stubbing out the provider. You could pretty much leverage the same contract as stub server that you're using with Specmatic on your local machine, on the CI also, because it's just an executable, like I already mentioned, so it can run in any environment. And for the provider side, once you're done with the unit testing, we recommend you run the contract test first before you run your component testing. The reason being, it is important that you verify the signature first before you verify the logic. The uh, explanation there is if the signature itself is broken, there's no point in really uh, testing the logic, right? So that's the reason for the sequencing. And since at this point, you have adhered to the specification, 
on both the consumer and the provider, both in the local and the CI, so for each of their uh, environments, you can confidently deploy to integration testing, right? And you know for sure it's gonna be compatible with each other, uh, which means you have an unblocked path to production. And from the heat map point of view, which we started this whole slide deck with, you are very much in the green, right? And you are very much in the left. So we are able to successfully shift left the identification of compatibility issues to the local and the CI, thereby keeping your higher environments always viable for testing such as workflow and whatnot, instead of always being stuck with integration testing. Now that's how Specmatic is able to help you leverage API specifications as executable contracts so that you can make independent progress on both building your consumer and your provider applications and confidently deploy them independently with while you can be sure that they're going to be play that they're going to play along well with each other when deployed together in a higher environment and i'd like to thank all of you for joining and being a very patient audience uh, we'd love to hear your feedback and this is an open source project so feel free to try it out. And if you find any issues or need help, uh, do file bugs and we'd be more than happy to look at it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much everyone for attending this session. Uh, special thanks to you, uh, Ari and Joy. Uh, the session was uh, really very well planned. The demos and everything were really, uh, uh, really well. So thank you so much for everything. Mm -hmm.